friend and colleague Jeremy Bowen, a well-known BBC correspondent who himself had to deal with bowel cancer, I think, four years ago. Jeremy, uh, thank you very much for coming in. And I will talk about your experience in just a moment. But, George, it was diagnosed too late. I guess you knew this was coming. Yeah, well, of course, because... And he knew. Everybody knew that however good the doctors are, if the cancer has spread, it's a matter of getting the right quality of life that you can have, the right mental attitude, which George definitely had, and time and hoping for the best. And, you know, he lived for nine years after his diagnosis. I think the figure is the five-year diagnosis for his kind of stage four cancer. The survival rate is about... 10%. So he did, you know, he beat the odds. However, as he would have said, it was going in one direction, and that's why he was so evangelical about getting, getting tested if you have any dodgy symptoms. Mm. But I guess the advanced state of the cancer when he was diagnosed is a sobering lesson for all of us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he had had symptoms. He's, he talked about this. I'm not giving anything away. He had symptoms which he explained away, he rationalised. He'd lost weight. Well, I'm trying to keep fit. I'm eating more veg. That kind of thing. But, in fact, it took when he started seeing blood. And the thing is, the thing about bowel cancer is people sometimes uh, get a little bit um, reluctant, a bit embarrassed to talk about it because it involves poo, it involves backsides, all these kind of things which, you know, we, we tend not to mention in polite conversation, yeah. but actually, if anything goes wrong in your uh, toilet activities over a period of more than a few weeks, you need to go and talk to someone. And if you get those uh, a little kit that people over a certain age get from the NHS, it's like a little test tube with a couple of, yeah. you know, uh, I, yeah. <laughs> like those little sticks you get in the cinema for yeah. ice cream, don't want to put anybody yeah. off, no. and you have to dig around and send off a sample, yeah. and they can pick up microscopic amounts of blood that way, and then you have a good chance of being treated when there's time, because yeah. when there is time, you can, you can live. Yeah. Well, I was looking at some statistics <clears throat> today which said that 30% of people who get those kits that you were just talking about uh, for bowel cancer screening completely ignore them. Well, guys, don't do it, because it could be your life at stake. It's as simple as that. I had no... None of the classic symptoms, you know, blood in the loo, losing weight, none of those things. But I had... And, and I had had, four years earlier, a, a, a what's called a, a virtual colonoscopy, that sort of big scan of my gut, and I had nothing wrong then. And in four years, I went from nothing wrong to having a stage three tumour. So my tumour was in my bowel and it was also in some of my lymph nodes. So what so, made you go and get tested? Well, I had had some pains and I wasn't sure and... There was a little bit of a family history, not enough for the doctors to get too worked up about. And I was actually, I was working in Iraq and I had this awful... And then in India, I had these very nasty pains and they, they put it down to something else. But then I, I went to my GP and said, look, I'd like to get a test in case. She said, all right, fair enough. Give us a sample of your poo. I left it on the receptionist's desk, neatly labelled. And uh, a few weeks later, they called me up and said, look, we found microscopic amounts of blood. And initially they said, don't worry, it's very early days. It's... But actually it was really quite advanced. I had to have surgery. I had eight rounds of chemo over six or seven months. I was really quite ill. And luckily, I had done that test. If I hadn't done that test, mm. I might not be here. And what did they say about that? If you'd have left it? Cos you were talking earlier about how <clears throat> these things can change. Well, it was, these polyps can grow very yeah. quickly. Well, it was already... It was if already, you hadn't have done that test, you, you'd have been... Well, it was already in, in two or three of my lymph nodes. Yeah. Next stage would have been to go, like with poor old George, into my liver, perhaps. And so I had to have quite big surgery, plus a lot of chemotherapy to try and knock out any cancer cells that were around. And I'm, I've got... And, and regular colonoscopies, which is... Uh, 
they, it sounds much worse than it actually feels mm. because they give you some good drugs. Mm. Uh, they put a, a, last week, a, a tube up your backside yeah. with yeah. a camera on it. I do. And uh, it's quite an interesting experience. Uh, <laughs> but I, I have them every six months now. Do you? I'm uh, going to have annual ones at least for months. Because my you might have a tendency to... Well, I, I develop polyps. polyps. and growth. Yeah, some, like colon, sometimes yeah. they harness, harvest about ten of them. Yeah. Chop them out. Some, yeah. are, some And some would have turned into cancer yeah. had they'd been left. But because I have this regular screening, they, they get them before they are... they develop into anything sinister. Now, George said uh, what I read, and I thought this is an extraordinary thing. He said that near the end, he said this. He said, obviously, I didn't want cancer, mm. which goes without saying. But there was this positive side, he said, in the sense of reappraising his life and what he had achieved. I just wonder, I mean, do you understand that? Yeah, I completely, I do. Uh, and, you know, I'm not comparing the situations because he had a stage four diagnosis. Mine was not as serious. Fingers crossed, I'm going to be OK. I'm nearly in five years in remission. You know, never say never, but I hope that's the case. Um, and, you know, I think being faced with a potentially terminal illness is something that does make you prioritise. And I got a bit tied up in the negativity of aspects of being in my midlife, you might say, I suppose. And, uh, and actually, the old, positive, optimistic Jeremy, I think, was quite revived mm. by having had to go through all of this. I had a lot of support from George. You know, he came down to my house, he gave me a packet of the Alagaya family secret recipe curry powder. <laughs> Wouldn't give me the recipe, he gave me the delicious yeah. spice mix. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, he chatted, we chatted on the phone, we'd text and things like yeah. that, and meet occasionally, you know, comparing yeah. notes. Of course, it, I, I got away with so much less in terms of treatment. But your message and his message I mean, it's the sake, get checked. Yeah, and if you get sent that kit, for God's sake, use it. Don't be an idiot. Mm. You're an idiot mm. if you chuck it away mm. because you could save your own life. Yeah, and just finally, uh, Jeremy, a, w a quick word about George, broadcaster, foreign correspondent, friend of yours. Yeah, well, I met him on his first day at the BBC. He turned up and another colleague, David Shuckman, and I, we showed him around BBC Television Centre, where we still were, and took him to the canteen and that sort of thing, and he was clearly a very nice guy. But then it emerged quite quickly, he was actually a very good reporter as well. And then what followed was a very, very distinguished career. Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.